confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Almighty and merciful God, you established your church with the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with that sacred fire that we may ignite with the passion for your will and flame our hearts to seek your good in the building of your church. And finally, burn down walls that keep us from your will. In the name we
uh, they actually are uh, second readings uh, that's scheduled for this particular Sunday, and it's uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, the sixth chapter. Paul writes, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore. And fasten on the belt of truth around your waist. And put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith. With which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak the word of the Lord. Are there any children out there who would like to come up for a children's message? Come on down. Come on down and gather around. That's so cool. Yeah. I have an association with an indoor archery range uh, in my community, and um, so I uh, asked if I could borrow the, this, this, these the things to, to use as a children's message. And she said, well, yeah, I have kind of a spare one that you can have. And, and so, but I had to promise her that I wouldn't shoot any of the children. Hi. Hey, what is this? Do you know what this is called? Huh? Bow and arrow, that's right. You know, and many people use this for hunting, don't they? But you know, a long, long time ago, they used to use this in war. And they would shoot people with this kind of a weapon. Yeah. Sometimes the people would attack a city, for instance, and the people would stand on the top wall of the city, you know, and they would shoot down on the, on the people below. And they'd have to kind of move aside and dodge and so forth and so forth. And, and, and sometimes they would wrap this with, with uh, cloth or some kind of a burning material and set it on fire. And, and then they would shoot the people with the arrow. That would, and, 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 and not only hit them with the arrow, and which would hurt, of course, but they would burn them, too. I mean, it was just horrible, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was so horrible, as a matter of fact, that a guy by the name of Paul, he wrote a parts of the Bible, and he, he used this picture as the way the devil works. See, the devil has these flaming arrows. Huh? Things, and it's, it's not like, you know, physical arrows, but spiritual arrows. You know, things like guilt. You know, feeling guilty. Like, it's, oh, I can feel like an arrow inside of us, can't it? Yeah. Or temptation. The devil will shoot us with temptation. Yeah. Or, or despair. Do you know what despair is? Uh, despair is when there's no hope. You, you know what having hope is like. Imagine having no hope for anything, for anything good. That's, that's real despair. And sometimes the devil would shoot us with that. Yeah? Or unbelief. Unbelief. Not believing. You know, these are just some of the arrows that the devil uses to, to, to shoot us in a spiritual way. To, to hurt our faith and to hurt our relationship with God. A loving God. Yeah. Can I borrow you? 
Huh? Could, can you just stand up? Okay. Come on out here. And you watch, okay? Now, I'm going to speak to you. This is, this is, you've done something wrong, right? You know you've done something wrong. Here comes the arrow of guilt. Huh? Now, wh what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Huh? You're going to move. All right, I'll go over here. Now, what are you going to do? Hey, go over here. Huh? Huh? You think, you think, huh? Well, you could do that, and, and it might work for a time, although you might get kind of tired after a while moving back and forth, huh? What else could you do to protect yourself from that arrow? Huh? Yeah, you, you, you don't have it on you right now. But it, Paul, the guy that wrote this, this Bible passage, he says, take the shield of faith. Now, put out your arm like you have a shield in front of you. Yeah. And see, no matter where I shoot, go over here or over here, you've got a shield in front of you to protect you from this arrow. And that shield is our faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? The, the, the coolest thing about that shield is it's not very heavy. You know, most of the time shields are, they, you know, that really protect you. They're, they're going to be big and they're going to be heavy. But this shield is not heavy at all. In fact, it's invisible. And it's a shield that God gave to you at your baptism. Huh? The shield of faith, the shield of Jesus Christ, who will protect us, not just from guilt, but also temptation, or despair, or unbelief. And we have that shield all around us, all the time. Yeah, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Just remember, you are protected by our faith in Jesus Christ against all the arrows that the evil one could ever shoot at us. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen, yeah. A pastor and an author by the name of Leonard Sweet, he told a story about going to the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he noticed that when he, when he came out, that he hadn't seen one picture. As a matter of fact, the entire Renaissance wing was not on the agenda for the tour. Huh? And suddenly he realized that he had not gone there as an art lover. He had not gone there as a student. He hadn't even gone there as a tourist. He had gone there as a parent of a bunch of squirming children. And they needed to see something big, something exciting, something awesome. And so they, their tour went to the Egyptian exhibit. And they saw the, the replicas of the, of the pyramids, you know, and they saw these huge stone uh, statues, and they, they saw these huge stone sarcophagi, you know, and of course, saw lots of mummies. But the most impressive part of the tour was when they went to the armory and saw not only armor, but, but weaponry that dated from about 400 B.C. all the way up to the late Middle Ages. And Pastor Sweet said, now, that was awesome. And he said he learned afterward that some of the army, army, uh, uh, armor for the late Middle Ages, especially uh, the, the, the metal workers, had, had done them with such precision and such intricacy and worked on them so much that they were suited more for parades than they were for actual battles. And he said, gosh, it was an achievement just to be able to put these things on without falling over. Huh? Much different than the armor that Paul talks about in this second lesson. The breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation. The shield of faith. The belt of truth. Huh? 
and the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is Roman armor that he was thinking of. Not only adequate for protection, but also for agility. And so I wanted to share with you our need for that kind of armor in the first place, but also the gift and the experience that God gives us when we indeed dare to don God's awesome armor. First, the need. Well, Paul talks about not a physical battle, uh, like a war battle, but, but a spiritual battle. He said, he said, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this, is, this is a spiritual war, a spiritual struggle that Paul is talking about here. And for that, we need spiritual, God's spiritual armor. You know, a fellow by the name of William Sloan Coffin, he once did a, uh, gave a little bit of an uh, article on uh, evil and why we personify evil as uh, the devil or as Satan. He said, it, it makes, it makes a, a, it a person. We, we make the evil a person, not because it, we can identify that with any specific person, but because we experience evil as an intensely personal experience. For example, James Baldwin, another author, uh, he was writing a book on uh, his uh, growing up years in Harlem. And uh, he said it took him about four, five or six years to finish this book. And so he ran through the advance that the publisher had given him very quickly, and he had to make a living. So he did some odd jobs. And one of them, of course, was waiting on tables in the restaurants of Greenwich Village. And one day he went into that restaurant uh, and, and asked for a glass of water. And remember, James Baldwin was black. And the waitress said, we don't serve Negroes here. That's back in the day. And, and he said, all the rage of the snubs and the insults he had experienced all his life welled up in him and overwhelmed him. And he picked up a pitcher of water and threw it at the waitress. And then he ran out of the restaurant. And he said, I, I, I was terrified. Not, not because of the consequences I might suffer for my act, but because I was willing to commit murder because of the hatred in my heart. And he, he, he moved to Paris, France, lived there for about 40 years, wrote 20 books, one of which was How the Devil Finds Work. It was in him. Right? A very personal type of experience, wasn't it? Pastor Coffin goes on to say that we also experience devil as a separate in an entity, a separate existence uh, from us, not because he works outside of us, but because he is greater than us. And we experience him as a power that's greater than we are. Sometimes if people are in recovery, for instance, uh, the, the first step of, of recovery is to say, I, I, I am powerless over whatever it is. And a, and a person can be very competent, very self-disciplined in every aspect of their life, except that one. They are powerless in that one place. Or maybe we can experience a sense of powerlessness, a sense of overwhelming power from evil in, in what we call mob mentality, right? where people will do things in a, in a group that they would never do as individuals. Right? There's a real power there that is so overwhelming, isn't it? And that, that, that's how we can experience evil, too. And then thirdly, uh, Pastor Coffin said that we experience evil as a fallen angel because he works not in our so-called lower natures, our physical nature, but in our so-called higher natures, our spiritual nature. As Paul describes in that lesson, our struggle is against spiritual forces of evil. There was a camp in uh, Washington State, and it was called Camp Quest, and uh, it was a normal uh, youth camp. You know, they did the usual things, you know, canoeing and swimming and rock climbing, and they had the campfires in the evening, you know, and so forth and so on. But the one unusual feature about this camp is that it was only for atheists. And there was a girl and a boy that were 
there, and they were interviewed once, and, uh, and asked, well, why are you an atheist, first of all? And, and secondly, why did you come to this camp? And they, they answered, well, they saw this, this, this adversarial relationship between science and faith, and they opted for the role of science. So that's why they were atheists. And they came to the camp because they said this was one of those places where they didn't experience bullying for being atheists. If you went to a Christian camp, even, they would experience this bullying. So they, they came here. I don't think there is this diversity between science and faith. I think both work together. But it seems in our society that, again, we're, we're drawing this distinction and discrediting faith as an experience. Of, of knowing in a faith way uh, because we've opted uh, entirely for, uh, for science, at least in some, in some arenas. There was a psychologist by the name of Lisa Miller. She was uh, kind of reviewing this camp and, and did a, a, an article about it. And she said, you know, spirituality is so important for the development of our children. She said uh, s- uh, spirituality can help with things like depression, for instance. And spirituality has been associated with things like good health, things like uh, uh, meaning and purpose in life, even things like greater achievement in life. Spirituality has an association with that. And she said that our spiritual development and, and the spiritual development of our children is just as important as the physical development, the intellectual development, the emotional development. It's all part of the whole human package. And we seem to be struggling with that, I think, with that, uh, against that idea, constantly, in some places anyway. Uh, and perhaps that's why we need also this uh, awesome armor of God. And awesome it is. Do you know that the armor Paul talks about in this lesson is not only the armor that God gives us to wear, but it's the armor that God wears God's self. In Isaiah 59, verse 17, for instance, the prophet Isaiah writes, God has put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation on his head. So these very things that Paul mentions as gifts for us to wear is what God also wears and uses to fight this battle, this spiritual battle on our behalf. In the Bible, righteousness has several meanings, but one of them is this. It's not the righteousness that God demands of us, but the righteousness that God himself exhibits toward us by fulfilling God's promises. If I make a promise to you, I will do this, and I carry through on that promise and do what I said, I would be declared righteous in the biblical sense. And that's what God has done in Jesus Christ. I promise to save them. I promise to rescue them from sin and from death. And he has done precisely that through the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is truth. Jesus is faithful. See, all of these things, this is the armor that God wears himself in Jesus Christ and uses it in this struggle against evil, against guilt, against despair, against unbelief. Now that is awesome armor. Several uh, years ago, I was at a uh, synod assembly, and one of the associates to the bishop was giving a sermon at one of the worship services. And the whole assembly was about fear and hope. And she said at the beginning of her sermon, there's one great fear that I've had. And she said, my greatest fear is that I am a fraud. That all that I've been preaching all these years is not real. It doesn't exist. It's not only worthless, but it's actually deceiving people. Because it's not real. And and I've spent all of these years preaching this gospel of Jesus Christ and, and I've just been a fraud. After the service was over, I went up to her and I said to her, I really am grateful you preached that message because I have experienced exactly the same thing. And in my life, 
God has protected me in this way over all of my doubts about creation or whatever else I may have in, in doubting uh, what, what I hear about God. There's one thing that has remained, and that's Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in his forgiveness. I believe that his way is the way, the truth, and the life. I am convinced of it. And that's not something I have done, but it's something that God has worked within me and is continuing to work in me through his spirit. That, that's just one story of how God is protecting me with his awesome armor by, by the name of Jesus. And our call, of course, is to put it on, to wear it. <laughs> Paul, in, in some of his letters, talks about, put on Christ. Yeah. And, and put on all that armor, that protection that goes with it. Right? And put it all on. Not just a piece here and a piece there, but the whole thing. Even the pieces that we might not really want to put on. One of those pieces, for instance, might be the belt of truth. The belt of truth. President G James Garfield is attributed it as saying, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. And Gloria Steinem, she kind of paraphrased that. She said, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you mad. Right? And that sometimes happens. It's hard for us to accept the truth. It, it was even in Jesus' day when these people wouldn't accept Jesus' body and blood as, as the truth of how they would be saved. Right? But the truth eventually set us free from all that would harm us. So, so put it on. Put it all on, the whole armor of God. Uh, Congressman William Jennings Bryant uh, from Nebraska, he was on a camp trail, a campaign trail once, and uh, one of the voters asked him why he was for free silver. And he said, I know nothing of free silver, but the people of Nebraska are for free silver, so I'm for free silver. I'll look up the arguments later. I'll look up the arguments now. Look at the facts now. Get to know the truth now. And then let us make our decisions. That's putting on the belt of truth, isn't it? No matter how unpleasant it might seem at the moment. Eventually, it's a truth that sets us free. Satan, evil, the devil attacks us in so many ways, but thanks be to God that he has given us every protection against his arrows. He's given us this armor, armor that not only is given to us, but that God himself wears and uses to fight on our behalf. Put it on, this awesome armor of God. Amen. rise and sing as we share our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray for the needs of the church, the human family, and all the world. Wise God, you invite us to set aside immaturity and to live in you, to provide all that we need, shelter, family, friends, clothing, health, and even new life in you each day. Make us bold to reach out in the love you have shown us so that we might share from all we have Keep us aware of the economic needs and calls for justice within our own community and around the world. Lord, in your mercy, creator of all, you call us to keep our tongues from evil and to stop showing disrespect towards people you have made. You require us to depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. We pray that through our actions of love, Others will be inspired to overcome prejudice, to stop fearing their neighbors, and that all might learn to live together. Give us your guidance, Lord, in your mercy. As the Lighthouse Child and Family Development Center moves from First Baptist to Washington Avenue Baptist, we ask for your guidance and protection. Guide the leaders and teachers of the center and protect them as well as the families and children they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Abiding Lord, bring your healing touch to all who are hurting. We remember Katie Brady, Jeff Dykeman, Roy Freeberg, Tiffany Giles, Karen Gullick, Bill Howard, Scotty Inman, Cindy Jones, and Dustin Jones, Jim Lampy. Alan Malcolm, Katie Mayberry, Greg Robinson, John Reynolds, Florence Stilwell Linda Waltz, and Ann Wilbur. You're Are there others that we should mention? Your spirit gives life today and into eternity. Bring your healing spirit into the lives of those who mourn, the family and friends of Agnes Mahizla and Wayne Spooley. Also, we pray for the family and friends of the three firefighters who lost their lives in fighting the fire in Washington State. Bless them, comfort their families, and bless all those who risk and give their lives in this very dangerous path. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and our great joy that we at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, our maker and redeemer and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and the stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and upon this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life. Your son, Jesus, to him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church now and forever. Amen. We gather together and pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. is the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread, this is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate for you.
This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. and blood our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. So the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his protection and his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>